the use of chemical weapons really began in the First World War, very primitively. First of all, they used chlorine, which is a sort of yellowish gas, so you could see it coming across the battlefields. In fact, the British Army recruited a whole group, I can't remember whether it was a battalion or a regiment, of chemists so that they could let the gas out of the cylinders. Then during the First World War, the chemical weapons became rather more sophisticated. The German chemist Fritz Haber, who is very well known for the Haber process for making ammonia out of nitrogen and hydrogen, worked extensively on developing chemical weapons. In fact, his first wife shot herself, possibly because of his involvement with these chemical weapons, or possibly because of his involvement with another woman. But he developed particularly the use of mustard gas, which is a carbon, sulfur and chlorine compound. But the rather macabre twist to the chemistry of mustard gas is that it has since been used, or derivatives of it, have been used in medicine. And more people have been saved by derivatives of mustard than were killed in the various uses on the battlefield. But the double irony is that Harbour invented his ammonia process to try and make fertilizer to feed the world. Because even then, in the early 1900s, people were worried about the expanding population. But his process has been used as the basis of making explosives ever since the F First World War. So his process to save people led to explosives and bombs. His mustard gas has led to new medicines. Chemistry and fate can be very strange. After the First World War, the whole world decided that, that chemical weapons are a step too far. I mean, it's, it's just such a horrific thing that everyone signed up to not using chemical weapons in 1925. Obviously, such military developments are classified, and I don't know about them, but I would be surprised with all the other developments that are going on that things have not been developed. I know that in the 1970s there were developments of so-called binary chemical weapons where the bombs did not actually contain the nerve agent, but as the bomb was launched, chemicals were mixed and the final stage of the reaction took place as the bomb was going towards its target so that you were minimizing the problems of the chemical weapons leaking out. There is a huge problem now that there are aging stockpiles in various places of chemical weapons that need to be destroyed. And when you're destroying them because they're so poisonous, you have to destroy them completely. And there are a variety of different technologies that people are trying to use. I think that chemical weapons obviously are unpleasant objects, but I think it's a little unfair to um, attack chemistry for chemical weapons any more than you would attack the mining industry for bullets or um, any other sorts of weapons. In the end, the use of military force to solve political problems is something which I hope is becoming more and more unacceptable across the world. We are very fortunate, despite all the conflicts that are raging in the world or have done in my lifetime, that we live in a much more peaceful time than people have in previous generations. There has been no conflagration in the same extent to the First or Second World Wars that affected my grandparents and my parents. And we should be very thankful for this. But the solution to solving the problems between nations is not to fire poisonous chemicals at each other. But the nervous system obviously uh, is involved in an awful lot of things from uh, various disease states. But 
things which completely stop the nervous system um, were developed many years ago, uh, primarily in the First World War, although some were uh, in the run-up to the Second World War, were, were, there were still some developments there. Um, <coughs> and these were there to, to maim or uh, stop the enemy, essentially, in, in any which way. So when we talk about chemical weapons and chemical warfare, what kind of chemicals are we talking about? What's going on here? Well, the very earliest ones were very simple things like chlorine gas. Fritz Haber then developed mustard gas, which was uh, a little bit more sophisticated in the way that it worked. It seems like quite a simple thing. It seems like anything mm, with a fluorine yeah. or... Uh, there, it seems like something you could do in lots of ways. What is it about sarin that makes it yeah. so effective a weapon? So it's, it's, it is simple. The fluorine is a very good leaving group. It's also small and electronegative, and that helps it become very volatile. Um, and it's the phosphorus which gets attacked by uh, the acetylcholine esterase. So this, this is a, what we call an electropositive reactive centre. Uh, so it is a very simple concept. Um, it makes a covalent bond. These days, medicinal chemists, uh, when they're inventing drugs to treat diseases, they try and steer away from covalent bond formation because it, it's irreversible in general. So this is an irreversible inhibitor. Um, of the acetylcholine esterase, uh, and that's it. Really, not not a good thing. You said it's irreversible, but you showed me how the antidote works. That's different, is it? Yeah. So um, by irreversible, I mean unless you add something extra to the mix, so that you could call this an anti-drug, if you like, it, it reverses the effects of the sarin. Then it becomes, um, you know, then, then you can reverse it. But in the normal circumstances, it's not reversible. However, there are, there, is, there are drugs that have been developed um, that work on acetylcholine esterase. So one of these is this molecule here. And this is an, uh, a reversible inhibitor. So this mimics the acetylcholine. And if I just stand that there, then you can see the similarities. So look at the, the blue one, the nitrogen. This is a cation, the tetramethyl trimethyl ammonium species, and where these oxygens are, so especially if I turn that the other way up, you can see that these match, and these are the key interactions with the acetylcholine esterase. It's the distance between this one and this one, and you can see it's very similar here. This, however, rather than transferring this group, transfers this group here. It's called a carbamate. So that does the same thing. This transfers onto the acetylcholine esterase, much like sarin does, or, or the, the vinegar molecule from here. The difference is that water can now break this bond here. It just does it much slower than, than releasing vinegar. And for some types of diseases, there's one called myasthenia gravis. It's a muscle wasting disease. And the muscles in the hands and the face can, can become very weak because um, you've got too much acetylcholine esterase, not enough neurotransmitter to make the muscles move. So you lose, like, one eye may always be down because you haven't got enough muscle to lift the eyelid back up. And this molecule, uh, neostigmine, can be used as a drug to treat that by temporarily taking some of that acetylcholine esterase out of the system, um, although it's only temporarily. So it's, like a, it's like a mild sarin. It's like a very, very mild sarin. It's controlled and it's reversible by natural processes. You don't have to add anything extra. Rob, you, um, you showed us what the sarin molecule looks like. You mm. mentioned it's illegal, but yeah. it doesn't look incredibly complicated. I mean, how it, is, can not. anyone make this? Um, it's quite difficult. Making fluorine or handling fluorine reagents is difficult. Um, fluorine uh, HF, hydrofluoric acid, eats glass. So normally people do chemical reactions in glassware. You can't use glassware, you have to use Teflon and other things. Um, it's, although the, it's a relatively simple molecule, um, it would be reasonably easy to make, but to isolate it would be very difficult because it's so toxic. And you would need really quite specialist equipment to be able to handle this without killing yourself. How do you have to administer this to people? Like, how, how are these things delivered when they're delivered 
bad, like when people yeah, are committing well, these atrocities? They're, they're very low boiling liquids, so they're, they're, they'll literally, if you pour petrol, for example, which is another low boiling liquid, on the ground, in a few minutes it's evaporated. You can smell it, and you know if you've lit a bonfire with some petrol with a match, well, it's the vapours have gone a long way, so when it goes, um, it's a very similar thing. Uh, so, you, literally, if, if you can deliver it in something which is going to sort of distribute it, an explosion of some sort is a good way of, of distributing stuff. Um, these are already a high, pretty high oxidation level in terms of phosphorus, so they're, they're, they're not going to be that affected by the explosion around them. Maybe some of the carbons maybe, but um, you'll probably distribute an awful lot in an explosion. I'm, I'm certainly no expert on delivering chemical warfare agents. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, on the Tokyo Underground they literally just released it. Um, you know, presumably opened a bottle and poured it on the floor or something like that. You know, and that, that, and that is the danger of this sort of thing. You know, chemical weapons, I would say, absolutely are appalling. Although there are, you know, uh, Haber, who invented mustard gas, um, he was a Nobel Prize winner. At the time, um, it was perfectly acceptable and, and indeed promoted by uh, the governments to develop these types of uh, mass killing devices. Uh, personally, I feel, you know, ethically, I, I hope I'm never in the position to be asked to develop anything of the sort. You know, I want to develop drugs which enable people to live longer. You know, this is what chemists uh, try and do. They enhance um, the world by inventing new materials. You know, if you look at your iPhone, it's full of all sorts of chemistry in there. From the, the liquid crystal display, the organic liquid crystal display, to the touch screen, um, all the way through the electronics. There's so much chemistry in there, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, and drugs which enhance life expectancy and quality of life. Um, you know, chemicals, because of you know, various things, the word chemical can have uh, a negative um, connotation, but, but chemicals are used all day in all sorts of things, from making materials for clothing to making your loo smell nicer uh, or whatever else.